And I would like to welcome my today's guest, Derry Dresden. Derry Dresden. One question: How do you properly pronounce your surname? Dresden. 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 And I've learned something which I still need to verify, because okay, guilty feeling here. I thought I'd give a little experiment on Chat, chat, <laughs> chat GPT, <laughs> um, because most people call Dresden have a D. In the, in the middle of their name, as in yeah. Dresdener, you know, or like the bank. Uh, but we don't. And uh, people always say, oh, are you related? No, 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 no relation to this thing. Um, and so this is always associated with Dresden, as in, uh, as in the town in Germany. And it was interesting because we've never traced the family that far back, but when it has been traced back, it's been traced back to Poland. Mm -hmm. So why is somebody called Dresdener living in Poland? And it's nothing, according to ChatGPT, to do with the town of Dresden. It's something to do with the a word to do with uh, a lathe. Uh, and so a lathe turner uh, was the role of people called Dresdner. Uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know whether there's any connection with that. Uh, I'm actually asking you whether the root of that word, maybe it's an ancient word, I don't know. Um, like I say, uh, unverified ChatGPT. Uh, revelation there when I asked it the question of what the difference was. Uh, it claimed to be that one was from Dresdner and one was the word for the late Turner. Right, now I see. So in that case, welcome our today's guest, Andy. J <laughs> Andy. <laughs> that is Dresdner. Oh, the, uh, Andy, the well-known anagram. <laughs> well-known anagram, yes. Uh, Danny is a professor of uh, Ma at Manchester University. He's a professor of cyber security. He also uh, changed the way the universities, especially in he teaches cyber security. Um, hello Danny, how are you today? Yeah, I'm good, I'm good. In fact, I'm really glad this is an air conditioned room because here we are in September <laughs> in Manchester uh, and just when we were debating to put the heating on, uh, well actually, yeah, that's actually to be honest, I actually fiddled with the time, I put it on last night and guess what, uh, it was so warm it didn't come on. Well, I suppose that's a result in its own way. Yeah, that's an unusual situation when you need to put air conditioning in Manchester, to be fair. Well, this is very true. Yeah, my only worry is, you know, that I always, I'm always too cold. I don't remember, what, when, especially when I think from the home perspective, that I ever need to put, put a fan. It was always too cold. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, the, the interesting thing I f f have found, okay, this is a small sample, and I know you shouldn't experiment on, on your children, so I can only report back from some of the children. Uh, always claim that we should always have to be able to put the heating on at any time and the idea that they should be able to like, walk around the house in t-shirts and shorts uh, it should be de rigueur and it's unreasonable of me to say put a jumper on or a cardigan on if it gets cold uh, which is a little bit scary I hope this is not the way that young people think in general because <laughs> I'm thinking but you know, never mind the, the bills I'm just thinking of the environmental the factors, and I'm just thinking if this is the way that all young people think that they should be able to put on as much heating in their houses and then just walk around in flip flops. Uh, <laughs> I hate flip flops. Uh, yeah, I think that would be the case if they didn't have to pay the electricity bill. <laughs> well, it's interesting because now we did, have, we did have the usual parental discussion where you don't pay the bills and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, but I was told that if one could afford it, then one should be able to do so and not have to worry about it. Uh, even down to the extent of why not, just, if you can afford it, why not just leave it all on all day so you come home to a warm house? And I was thinking, hey, well, a little bit better than that. Yeah, <laughs> to be fair, I've got, I've got the timers in my um, in my radiators to heat the, ho the, the home uh, before, but to be fair, I never used it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but Danny, why are we talking? What are we talking about today? I think that's important, uh, important question. And uh, when we look at neurodiversity and cybersecurity and all of the statistics, there is a couple of things. Thirty-four people, autistic people, I would say here, select STEM industry tech-related. When we look further into cybersecurity, it is estimated that over 65% of people in cybersecurity alone is neurodivergent. So 
I would like to find out, I would like to tell our guests to find out what's so interesting in cybersecurity, what's nitty gritty details, what's going on there that attract new emerging individuals. So I think what we need to establish here, what is cybersecurity, what's happening in cybersecurity that attracts people, especially in your life budget? Well, un untested theory this, but it is through a lot of observation. The first thought that one might have is that there are so many branches, so many different facets, so many different aspects to cybersecurity, from the kind of the high level organizational, even inter organizational sides of governance, and risk, and compliance, all the way through to detecting and dealing with very nitty gritty vulnerabilities uh, in fairly obscure pieces of equipment, you would actually think that the breadth and amount of details going on at any one time in what we would label cybersecurity might be the very thing which would make it difficult for somebody neurodiverse because it, by its almost by its sort of definition, I keep using this term, by its description, it, it's overloading. It's exactly the kind of thing that you would expect to be a cruel thing to lay upon somebody who's neurodiverse because you'd have, uh, you'd have all of these inputs all going on at once. But maybe a bit like judo, where Douglas Adams would always say that the problem itself becomes the solution. He always used to talk about if you've got a, a 20 stone person running towards you, the judo movement means that the 20 stones then becomes their problem as you pivot them over and they find they, they're now flying through the, the air and got 20 stones to try and not hit that <laughs> on the ground. So perhaps the problem is its own solution because amongst all of that noise and all of those inputs and outputs and activities and cyber security, there is a need to be able just to say, right, I'm going to focus and this is what I'm going to deal with. And so that ability in that to be able to shut everything out and concentrate on that one pixel on the screen, which means something on a chart, that's a particular skill, I think, which is very fitting for people who are newer diverse. Do you think it's UK Cyber Security Council divides cyber into 16 specialisms. Do you think that the fact that there is a so many different little portions of cyber people can focus on, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a way of to say there is those little pixels and there is, a, they, there is a need for people to focus on those little pixels. That's why we've got 16 specialisms according to cyber councils. Do you think it's a, it's a right uh, divide? So do you think that there is as many special, uh, specialization within cyber? I think it's more of a, it's more of a recipe. Mm -hmm. I think we need to do the exercises, like the one set out by the UK Cyber Security Council. I mean, the fundamental work was done, well, probably started in, I'm guessing, 2007 with Professor Fred Piper. From Royal Holloway, when he and some other people founded uh, what is now the Chartered Institute for Information Security. Uh, and they came up with a model essentially saying okay, if you're going to be a member of an institute for what they call then information security, we're now talking about cyber security, it's still information security on most people's plates. Mm -hmm. They identified you know, particular th skill sets that people should have. But I think the best thing that they did was to identify that, yes, there are going to be some areas that people are super duper experts on. You know, they've got the experience, they've got the background knowledge, and they can communicate it as well, so they have some great leadership uh, opportunities in that side of stuff. All the way through to people who just want to um, get on with the job, sit in front of the terminal, just for, uh, for example, and uh, uh, you know, analyze or code, um, or just plan and design the uh, plan and design the architecture, all the way through to a, a kind of a bottom layer of people who, yeah, they're just aware, 
And actually, this is a this is a really important thing. People who are just aware that yeah, there are other roles and perhaps people who need to be spoken to. And with the different specialisation, so I think you mentioned this, the UK Cyber Security Council has uh, identified uh, 16. 16. Yeah. I think the original model with uh, CSEC, the Institute, was 14, 12 or 14. Mm -hmm. Don't know. That's not re that's not really important. But the point being is that there are certain pieces of um, certain um, bodies of knowledge, uh, knowledge areas, uh, to, uh, to use the term used by the cybersecurity body of knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, which is curated. Uh, okay, it's a politically wrong in terms of it, but okay, but at bottom line, essentially curated um, by the National Cybersecurity Centre. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the wonderful work is done at Bristol University and other universities as well. But just for simplicity, <laughs> the national model. Cyborg. It, it's important to know that there are knowledge areas and you can specialise, but also to know how to make the communication and be able to navigate towards other people who will have the specialisation and the knowledge that you haven't got, and it, which is something actually we haven't we haven't quite cracked. There's also an old industry thing which makes me, I mean I'm thinking back to my, my original job. My original job um, was for a firm called Ferranti. Yeah. Uh, certainly in the, fir in the form that it was then, it certainly isn't now. I mean, huge in Manchester, there were sites all over the place. I worked on two different sites, 1500 on one, 2000 on another. I think there were about 10,000 people around, uh, around Greater Manchester. Was it, we're, before, we're that. was it before that we, the cyber was commonly known? Oh my! Oh, absolutely yes. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 don't don't be distracted by my young looks. We're talking. <laughs> we're, we're talking 1985 here. 1985. We're talking 1985. Oh dear. And I was in a project group, which <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at it, which for whatever reasons of people's organisation had lumped together the two disciplines of road transport and printing. <laughs> But the group manager for this uh, mm -hmm. was an engineer, happily doing the engineering work. But to progress, he had to take on a management role, which meant he got further and further away from the actual hands-on work. And I fear that there are probably still situations, and this is exactly why I think we have to be more sensitive for neurodiverse colleagues. Um, that people say, yes, okay, I know you've got some great technical skills, uh, or it may be more in the kind of the risk calculation and the, the governance areas, mm -hmm. that to progress beyond those, money-wise and career-wise, you have to take on responsibilities for managing other people. And this might be fine for some people, many people, but I think that takes people away from what they should otherwise be focused on. I mean, we talk, oh, sorry, people generally go on, oh, it's very important for people to have soft skills. Yeah. Rubbish. <laughs> it's a silly term. They are not soft skills, they are core skills. They are core skills. But not everybody is happy about communicating. My first job back in those days at Frantic was as a technical writer. Why? Because we had some brilliant designers, architects, and programmers who couldn't tell the, the police, road engineers, councils, etc., etc., how to install and run the road transport systems. I didn't do very much on the printing systems. So I was employed to translate what they were doing into the maintenance information for their own engineers to run and install. Uh, or for their operators to be able to run the systems. So and, handbooks. And, and, and handbooks, absolutely, handbooks and manuals. That was a very, and that also um, morphed into the, into the user interfaces and um, how, how these systems were, were seen from outside. But it, it was a collaboration, and I, and, I had, and I had my focus. And it would be absolutely wrong to try and make these people a jack of all trades. So many, also in that kind of in that tech environment, um, people who I probably didn't realise at the time, but thinking back, they probably were also neurodiverse, mm -hmm. but they were thriving because we had this Structure. division, 
of the different roles, but also we still maintained the contact. And that's what we miss a lot, and I don't think we've cracked it yet, in any of the kind of industry models, whether it's the, uh, whether it's the institute, whether it's the council, whether it's the cyborg, is the navigation. And being able to say, fine, you don't have to be an expert in those areas, but you know who to call. I mean, it's actually um, an area I'm probably pretty passionate about because it was part of the areas I investigated as my, in my PhD. Uh, which wasn't that long ago, really. I, when, when did I graduate? 2011. 2011, I graduated. I only, I only went back to university when I was 42. I was mm -hmm. only 42. I mean, just between you and me, just between you and me, mm -hmm. getting a 2 2 poly degree was a great achievement at the time, but they don't take you for a PhD program with a 2 2. So, oh, anyway. So, just, <laughs> no, we just, don't. just keep that to yourself, okay? <laughs> okay, thanks. So, one of the things that I looked at was the uh, aggregation and collaboration of knowledge within communities. And everybody laughed a few years back, some years back, about this um, Secretary of State in America called Donald, Donald Rumsfeld, who said that you know, there are things that we know and there are things that we don't know and things that we know we don't know. And everybody laughed when he said there are things that we don't know that we don't know. And they all thought this was hysterical. Um, which, okay, uh, maybe if you haven't heard it before, then it should be a little bit amusing, and I don't think there's anything wrong in having a laugh over all of this stuff. I mean, cybersecurity is such a serious thing that if you don't have a laugh occasionally, uh, you will probably burn out and you will feel, you will feel strain. So you have to maintain a sense of humor. Uh, I mean, having a very, um, what's the word, gothic, uh, British sense of humour um, probably helps in this uh, in this situation, and I laugh on laugh at things that I should be ashamed of. <laughs> but it means that you've got this opportunity to you know to realise that firstly not everybody will know everything, but there are some people who are, have areas of expertise, and the skill is knowing when to call in that expertise. So we built this great system and it works and it fulfills all the requirements. Unfortunately, we hadn't thought of what all the requirements should have been because we hadn't brought anybody with legal expertise in. Mm -hmm. And what we've now done is illegally. It doesn't handle data legally according to GDPR or whatever, whatever rules that, uh, that, that, it, that it needs to. So it's this way that we traverse all of these different skills. But at the same time, it's not just the technical knowledge, uh, and I use technical in a very broad sense because I, I am considering uh, communication skills in a particular way to be able to give over information about uh, cyber or the workings of systems, um, uh, all the way through to people um, writing code, people testing um, for cyber security vulnerabilities, people Fixing those, 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 those vulnerabilities. Um, I, I use that. I use that very widely. So we've got, we've got, the, we've got the challenge of all of those different roles and all of that knowledge uh, in the first place. But also, we've got, the, uh, you know, a community of people who will look at things in different ways. Um, and that's what I kind of love about my classes. I mean, when you look around the room, um, you know, the, the it. The, I, teach mostly masters, so most of my students are actually international, mm -hmm. but that's great because you're coming from completely different cultures. So you've got some people, who are the really scary students, uh, and I say they're scary because I open my mouth and they're writing it down, there's no discussion. Yeah. Uh, there are other students uh, whose heritage makes them question, and sometimes it's quite harsh. <laughs> yeah. um, and there are other ones who, of course, are my favourite ones, who will question, but they're very they kindly question. <laughs> and I realise that yes, I have to uh, I have to up my game, and perhaps I have to explain something as well, or maybe I haven't thought of all the various options. But because of those different people coming at things from different uh, of those different angles, that really really contributes to the discussion and helps us to think. So we have, so one of the one of the programmes they all, they have to uh, I give them a case study fictitious case study and they have to design the architecture for this. Mm -hmm. uh, throw, throw, throw them together in those different groups 
But it's not just the, the technical knowledge, it's that cultural background. So also, it's the opportunity that there will be neurodiverse students in the room, who again will focus on that one part. The important thing is giving them their voice and being, them being able to come out and be able to say in this friendly environment. And this is one of the things that we, uh, we need to encourage more and more. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, we, um, uh, you know, the cyber security world is a challenge mostly, not all, but mostly because we're in an adversarial situation. You know, there are bad people wanting to do bad things with systems which are otherwise meant to do good things. So, what the worst thing that we can possibly do is fight amongst ourselves, is not to give each other the right opportunities. So we need to look out for the quiet people. We need to ask people, direct people, people to realise that their skills are focusing on that pixel. I, I probably fixate on that, because this goes, again goes back to uh, Ferranti. Um, one of the things that we did uh, in my next job where I went to um, the, the, the division of creating training uh, equipment, uh, it was late one evening and there was a guy just sitting there staring at a screen uh, and essentially it was a, 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 simula a, a battleship simulation oh. and he was very worried that one of the stars in the sky kept shining through the towers of one of the, battle the battleships. <laughs> okay, well, we were talking like, like pixel type of stuff, yeah. but, it, but it's the patience yeah. to deal with that kind of stuff. You know, coupled with the people who are having the big ideas and working and talking and, and the respect which is required between the between. I mean, I think one of the problems that we have in society, among the most misused words, uh, is tolerance. So people are, you know, people are very different and we're told that we have to tolerate differences. No, we don't. We have to respect differences. In fact, we have to more than respect them. We have to actually nurture and bring those differences closer because we can't think of everything all at once. Um, you know, be, you know, you know, some students are used to reading, you know, from right to left. It gives people, you know, it gives people a different view of the world. So, you know, we, th you know, we, we think of, uh, of a particular flow, a particular representing in information. And then, of course, something comes in the wrong direction and we you know, oh, we can't cope with that. And we try and screw what we're doing into something which is familiar to us, uh, you know, and, uh, and fighting nature. If we if get these different views, uh, you know, technical, expert, technical expertise, cultural knowledge, neurodiversity, and respect that, and nurture that, then that gives us the opportunity to work together to keep an eye on this complexity that we call cybersecurity. Because out there, there are bad people who will see the, 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 the cracks and rush along them to do stuff. If we work together, we, we can remove those cracks. And I'm not just talking about adding a bit of polyfill up, I'm actually talking about building systems which don't have those vulnerabilities in the first place. Yeah, of course, we're still going to have the problematic systems for years to come. In fact, probably forever. Well, that's why we're here to fix those issues yeah. as well. You but, know? We want, but we want to reduce them. We want, yeah, to, we we, want. We want to get to a stage. I, I, I call it that, um, uh, that we're now in a, a period of inevitable risk. But we can move out of that into a better situation where we're actually building better. I mean, there, it's interesting uh, because um, there's a big program at the moment called Digital Security by Design. Mm -hmm. And I heard a colleague um, not to, uh, to talk about it, not in glowing terms the other day, but he sort of missed the point. He, he sort of missed the point, and this is an interesting thing I think in, in academia. This digital security by design is actually doing some really fantastic fundamental work in hardware. Um, goes back, let's get technical, you know, to, you know, to buffer overflows which have been known about since the 1970s. So rather than expect programmers to remember that this is a problem and code around this problem, They've been designing a chipset which doesn't have this problem built into the hardware. Fantastic. Now, the reason why this colleague was a little bit disparaging was because it was just hardware-focused. Fine. 
okay, but that goes, that hardware work goes together with all the other work with the software and the architecture. And it's a step, it's a step forward. It's a step forward, remembering and <coughs> using these things. And of course, you know, we've got countless systems. Um, it's all well and good. For example, we now, you know, we have a law in place now that says, you know, IoT devices, um, that you know, there has to be a, a vulnerability, um, an, an updating program, and manufacturers have to declare for how long devices will be updated. Now, in terms of organisations, particularly if they want to be seen to comply with the expectations of cyber essentials, for example, will have to stay up to date. They will have to replace old equipment which isn't being maintained. Or have encryption. Exactly. But I think about all of the other users on the internet, the personal users, it's all well and good for an organisation. Okay, we need to replace some kit, all goes into our pricing structure, we can make that money back. Uh, you know, personally, you, you, know, you buy a phone, uh, yeah. have you got the right deal and the right contract and the updating? Um, you're probably not going to rush out and update it just because they say it's not going to be maintained anymore. Oh, you know, it's working, you know, it's effective, it's efficient, uh, it does all the things that I, that I want it to do. So it's using old software. I don't need a certificate for cyber essentials. Uh, I'm not saying this is good, necessarily good practice, but we're going to have plenty of old kit. We're even going to have old kit distributed. I was talking to a new scientist uh, a couple of months ago because uh, someone had done some work and found, um, some, I'm sure this goes on elsewhere as well, that police in America were essentially selling on confiscated equipment. Um, <laughs> um, and of course, there was the issue of it being out of date by the time it got released. Uh, there was also the issue of it having some of the criminal's data still on <laughs> it as well. So, uh, so get involved in a police auction, Buy a, uh, buy a mobile phone and get your uh, criminal underworld contacts thrown in for free. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of you talking to my friend. My friend works for the company, well known company, which still uses fax machines. Mm -hmm. Who uses fax machines now? <laughs> uh, clearly, people do, some. <laughs> well, exactly. And, and, and that always comes down to the respect yeah. issue. There's no point saying, oh, well, you know, that's old kit, go away. It's, I always compare it to a company which has some sort of, um, what, do they, what, what do you call it, you know, marketing makeover, and they have a new logo. PR. They, they, they <laughs> all, all, all the PR and marketing stuff. Somewhere, they will have, at the bottom of a, fi of a stairwell, uh, of a, the fire escape, there will be a set of fire instructions which will still have the old logo on it. So you can't get rid of everything. Yeah. You won't get rid of everything, but you need to be able to compensate. In the same way, in the same way that you'll get people, you know, you know with, diff with different views, different ideas, um, culturally, uh, neurodiverse, but also, I mean, we often talk about getting people into cyber security. One of the things that happened a few, a few uh, some years back, um, we realised how popular our courses were, and one of my colleagues said, what we should be doing is putting in some tougher entry criteria, for two reasons. Firstly, that if we have tougher entry criteria, then we get better results yeah. coming out from the students because we're getting the better students, which is all very nice. But also, we get fewer students because it's harder to meet those entry criteria. There is also a danger when you think about it that the way how neurodivergent individuals approach tests and exams, sometimes it may be very difficult to pass through this, pass through this moment, even though they may have the right skill. So it's uh, always about finding a balance. That's that's a that, that's a very good that's a very good point. I mean, it, it's using the it's using age old me mechanisms of filtering, which have brought us to where we are today, of actually reducing diversity rather than encouraging it. Now I don't necessarily argue things well, but I'm quite pleased that on this occasion I, I won the fight. <laughs> because I don't want anybody coming on and failing and not doing well, and I think we do generally well. It's, inter you know, it's interesting to see uh, kind of, you know, different years and different cohorts and different recruitment policies uh, for, for the university, how, how it affects them sometimes. But not everybody who will take the cybersecurity modules. It's very interesting because if you get feedback from students saying, I didn't know anything about cybersecurity, but I'm really interested in it now, which is fabulous. 
But I always think, well, if you didn't know anything about it, how come you gambled your degree on taking a some, uh, something that you didn't know about beforehand? Well, this is great, you know, that they're showing some willing to learn uh, and, and explore. If you think you or your child may have ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, start by taking an online self-assessment or by speaking to a GP. So, I'm not necessarily suggesting that I'm very good at winning arguments, but I did win the argument against the filtering to get smaller classes. I'd love smaller classes. That's mocking heaven. No, uh, I would want smaller class because not everybody is going to end up necessarily going into a cyber security career. And that's the way it should be. If everybody went into cyber security, be nothing then, else. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah who's, who's going to create all the, the actual um, things that, that cyber security supports? But people who will go out in, to, to carry out other roles, um, maybe using their MSc, uh, computer science from the University of Manchester, maybe not, but everybody will touch on technology in some way. This technology will have vulnerabilities. It might be this year, next year, it might be 10 years time, it might be 20 years down, down the line. When their experience of cyber security at the university will just connect those few neurons together to suddenly realize that this is a good choice or a bad choice. And that good choice or bad choice could be the difference for one organisation. Remember, organisations aren't nebulous things. You know, there are people. <laughs> We're talking about people's jobs, their livelihoods. That yeah. one person's decision. Okay, I suppose the crude story is click or don't click. <laughs> but they, their decision, That's a uh, uh, it might actually be in an operational side, it might be in the design, it might be putting their two penneth into the design of a, of a new architecture or change for, for their organisation. Because they've had that experience and that opportunity to discuss cyber security all those years ago may make a huge difference, uh, which might be the difference between an organisation, a company, uh, surviving or not. And that's why I was really pleased that they didn't have this, this filtering. I mean, there's enough filtering to get onto the courses in the first place. Yeah. Uh, you know, thank God people do want to study. Uh, it's a popular place. Manchester's absolutely brilliant. And you've noticed uh, increased as well, you said, yeah. year on year? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and the, I mean, the University of Manchester is absolutely fantastic. I would say that, wouldn't I? But <laughs> I haven't been there, or haven't been teaching there for 20 years for, for, for nothing. Um, I've turned down offers from elsewhere, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> And I still do get involved in other universities, which is great because you see, you know, you get to mix with colleagues and the other teaching things. But we remove that idea of filtering just to expose more people to the opportunity to study, get something out of it, and go off and embed. I always say that my, what I'm doing is creating a fifth column. I mean, I'd love for people to say in Manchester. Okay, it's an international audience, some will stay in Manchester, many will go back. So I've now got students everywhere from Tanzania to Mexico, um, China, everywhere, um, who I am, I'm, 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 I'm east to west, not, you know, north to south as well, um, who have experienced some of our cyber security activities and are hopefully now a fifth column for good in the companies and the communities that, that, that they've settled in and run families or not or whatever, whatever uh, you know, life choices that they've actually made. But we've sown the seeds and set them up to a, in, a, in a diverse way. And some of my favourite photographs uh, you know, that I take uh, as kind of mementos of the activities is just seeing people uh, you know, with, you know, with the, kind of the, you know, different clothings, costumes, <laughs> colours, sizes. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's just absolutely fabulous. And you're looking around and you're thinking, yeah, these, you know, these are just the visual, the visual characteristics. Yeah. You're just thinking about the visual characteristics. So it also makes you think about 
some of the uh, of the hidden characteristics as well. The cultural cultural background. It's, it all you know, I think it all mixed together well. You know, when we are all with different backgrounds, different situations, different ethnic groups, uh, different neurodiversity, different neurodiversities. Uh, I think that's all contributed to us giving a better output and. Uh, there was actual research about uh, when you mix, when you leave, when you leave, when you try to develop something, or innovate, the mixing environment, neurodivergent and neurotypicals mixed together, plus different ethnic backgrounds and cultural backgrounds, that's what drives innovation. Not five same blocks sitting on a table and doing the one thing. They may be very good, but when you mix them, it will produce much better results, and that's the biggest advantage of mixing them. All together. Oh, you know, absolutely. And it touches on it touches on one of the basic laws of cybernetics. And I, I there are probably <laughs> there, there are probably people out there who and I, I can think of one friend particularly who will be going hump cyber. Is it Stuart? Cyber, hmm? Is it Stuart? It's not Stuart. It's not Stuart. <laughs> it's, not Stuart. Uh, it's a brilliant colleague called Daniel Card. I'm sure mm -hmm. you won't mind me giving him a shout out. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the it's one of the things and actually Part of the strength is, is that we don't agree on everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so this is actually working already. Um, <laughs> that, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that, you know, maybe one of the few things we have in common is uh, a lot of the doing good things in cyber and being called Daniel. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know how, 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 how many overlaps we need. But what some people say is that cyber and cyber security have nothing to do with cybernetics, which was the science which essentially was defined and established some people say 1948, some people say it actually goes back to the, uh, the roots in the 19th century. But it's about uh, circular and causal relationships, it's about steering. And what do we do? We want to steer our data around our systems, whether that's in data processing, personal information, or whether it's the control data. I think it's very important that people remember these two different sorts of data. The control data, which is going to decide whether you are going to drop a uh, a sack full of sodium hydroxide into the, uh, into the drinking water as they was a issue out in uh, in Florida was a few years a few few oh. years ago. But it is all about cybernetics. It's all about it's all about the flows. It's about controlling those flows so the right data in the right way gets to the right place. So we're not talk, talk, just talking about confidentiality, which we understand, availability, which people pretty hot on when because nobody likes it when it's not working. But importantly the integrity. Um, people talk about the CIA trying out integrity I think is often the uh, the correlation because it's not so easy to understand. But cybernetics, one of the rules of cybernetics, um, as defined by uh, a scientist called Ashby, uh, and Ashby design defined the law of requisite variety. What's and, that? And that basically says that if you've got a problem with many facets, you have got to raise the same number of facets, probably if you've got n facets, you probably need n plus one, to be able to counter and control and react to those facets. So it's so true, so out there, we've got the, the old adage is that uh, we have to be lucky every day, and the criminals only have to be lucky once. <laughs> so we've got all of that, we've, you know, many much of which is automated. Which is automated can be helped by cyber essentials. <laughs> but then it's good, but that's another discussion you see. It's interesting that people get diverted and, and, and you give them a few simple things that they can do, but they want those few simple things to be like a, a magic wand and a silver bullet and to cure everything and to cure everything. Whereas security is a constant uh, awareness. Um, and I, I love the MI5 MI slogan. Um, I can't quite remember the the, the Latin, so I, uh, it was something like, um, oh no, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. But uh, the, the, the English is basically um, security is the war is the security is the reward for never ceasing vigilance. But vigilance is only one part of it. It's also being able to act, and that's the, that's the big the thing that I have against. Um, all of this talk is, oh yes, everybody needs to be aware, everybody needs to be aware. Well, firstly, when we're asking people to come to their cybersecurity awareness training and don't click on this and do this, that and the other, and give them, give them the rules to follow, what we're not doing is being completely honest and saying, actually, we've built up systems with 
vulnerabilities and problems. There are attackers out there and we want you to compensate for the fact that we haven't built our systems to take into account that there are attackers out there. And um, could you fix it now, please? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, so we're sort of... Um, so I think awareness, it, it, awareness is really about kind of almost like setting people up uh, as, as, as the cannon fodder. And it's great because then you've got somebody to blame, which is exactly <laughs> what it should be. <laughs> You said you mentioned cybernetics. There's a data security, cyber information security. Is it all all, uh, all different things? No, or is it not? Well, it's in, it's an interesting discussion to have. Yes, there are different things, different levels, different layers to all of these different things. Uh, cybernetics is not just about information security. It's, you know, cyber, you know cyber, cybernetics, as I said, is you know is about circular and causal feedback mechanisms. Um, you know, which is really what we design our systems, you know, our systems to do. You know, re um, re you know record, record some information, turn it into um, in, in, into, into, into binary. I will restore it, play it back, retrieve it, process it, um, find problems with it, correct those problems. It, it, it's all going on in loops. You know, cyber security, information security, one a subset of the other. What is really important is to remember that our focus here is about cyber security. Uh, or, you know, the security of our systems, which are doing things and the movement and steering things towards the right, the right thing. The, many people then start getting hung up. I was to come to which organization? One organization, I was told, the other day, had something like 17 definitions of cyber security. <laughs> Not particularly useful, unless it keeps people talking. And Professor Debbie Ashenden, whose university in Adelaide, somewhere in Australia, so Debbie, can't remember which university <laughs> it is, used to be at Cranfield, which is I think where we, where we got to, uh, to, to know each other a, a lot better. Uh, published a book some years back, um, can't remember her, her co-author, but in that book, uh, she says cyber security is a discourse, and that's the important thing, is to keep talking about it, and not to get too hung up on definitions. Sometimes that's important, particularly when the lawyers are involved. But we have to be agile, with careful about using that word. We have to be <laughs> fleet of foot and be able to move on and implement it. Because I always say that you know, the criminals do not sit around uh, a table and decide, you know, you say, well, <laughs> we're not going to act until we can think of a, you know, a really good name for our bank house. <laughs> uh, whereas we want to, we realise there's a problem we want to solve, and of course what everybody's doing is uh, is spending the first hour of every meeting, a uh, meeting arguing over what we're going to call the project. <laughs> a good acronym. And another one. <laughs> another, 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 another one. Another one to the collection in cyber. Well, we're talking about. I think it's worth to make our uh, listeners aware that cyber security is not only technicality. It's not only risk. If they said that, if we can say that uh, maybe differently. I was at one of the one, one of the uh, cyber conferences in March this year, and there was a conference probably around 100, uh, 200 people about cyber security, having a front by the cyber security council, UK cyber security council, and uh, one of the speakers asked all of the audience how many technical cyber people was in the audience. Maybe 10 out of all of those people who were there raised their hands. All of the other side of the audience was on the DRC side, so governance, risk and compliance. Could you tell us a bit more about the differences? Yeah, absolutely. So they're, it's, it's, it's almost like layers, but they're not separate layers. There has to be the interaction between the technicality delivering the actual systems, processing the data, uh, dropping the fuel, fuel rods into the reactor when it needs to, uh, when it needs to be uh, uh, less, less reactive. That's probably a very the number of times I've watched the, uh, that really good um, drama documentary on, on Chernobyl. I should be able to. Oh, that's an amazing it. documentary! Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we, 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 act, uh, we have a, a one of our fast days. One of the Jewish fast days uh, is actually it's actually a day of mourning. There's been all kinds of tragedies. Um, get it through a, a fast. It's, it's in the middle of summer as well, so we're talking a long. Uh, we're talking about long time to because you can't eat until it gets dark. It's not just in sunset, but actually when it gets dark. So, uh, how do you keep your mind off, uh, uh, you know, not eating? 
so yeah, I'm a six hour drama documentary about your novel. So it's <laughs> not joy, it's not exciting because it's a day to remember many, uh, sort of, yeah. uh, many global tragedies. Um, but yes, so, so, so it's, it's really well based. So over the last few years, I've got it out and it keeps me going through, through, through the day. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really should be able to uh, kind of, uh, or almost recite, uh, recite the script from it. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. So, so you've got people who have the skills and the knowledge, it's back to these different knowledge areas, to actually create systems that do stuff. But these systems have to fit into organisations, they have to fit into communities, um, and more often than not, they are not designed by any one entity. I mean, even, I mean, probably every device in this room, every piece of equipment in this room, even you know, even the, even the mugs <laughs> on the table in front of us, there's some sort of supply chain involved. Um, whether it's uh, to you know to develop some you know, some of the software or some of the hardware or supply the glaze. Uh, or there was once I once read a, a very interesting kind of journey story, um, and program robotics. Uh, no, no, it was about chocolate. <laughs> oh, it was about chocolate. Um, and <laughs> I, le I learned from that is that not only you know, in a box of chocolates do you get all of these different flavours, um, and you might have the cherry flavour, which is what I talked about. So <laughs> did eat cherry other flavours. You know, real cherries not so bad, but cherry flavours like banana flavour. Yeah. Oh, you mean like it would be better with a real cherry? Yeah. yeah. Rather than cherry so, flavor. Yeah, yeah, the the companies <laughs> specialize in a particular cherry flavor. And, the, and, the, and So the company making the chocolates get all of these different flavors. And, 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 as it, and this is the way it is with, with, with our equipment. So we have all of this complexity. So where are they very big news at the moment uh, in terms of international relations? And stuff, where bits of equipment which goes into other systems actually comes from. So the decisions of who you deal with, how much you deal with them, how you connect with them, these are the bigger picture areas which need to be decided by the governance, risk and compliance. One of the modules uh, I teach actually focuses very much on governance and risk. The compliance bit should drop out of it. The problem with compliance, and it's still a plague today, is that people will do it because they tick the box, they followed the rules, uh, they met the legal requirements, therefore, uh, if there's a problem, um, then their, to use an alternative, their, their, their backside is, is, is covered, uh, which I probably think goes back to the old British type of school that I went to, where if you were naughty, you got called to a teacher and you had to bend over. So <laughs> you have your backside covered, so you try and stuff a book down. down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like, we're talking 1970s stuff. here, when I, uh, 60s and 70s, you know, we're not talking, we're not talking about Victorian England. I'm not that old. <laughs> but we've got the governance, risk and compliance people who I would liken to the conductor in an orchestra or the or the um, person in the in the red coat in the circus who is making sure that all of these people are in the right place at the right time. There are there is actually a an international I love international standards. Standards are great because it means that somebody else has done the thought. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, how, it's how people <laughs> use them. And again, often people will use them and say, oh well don't want to are you doing it to comply with the standard or to fit in with this conversation? Are you doing it because you want to be as secure as possible? No, to say as secure as possible or secure enough. I don't say secure because we all know there's no such thing. Because then we're back to definitions, then we're back to conversations, and while we're busy having the conversations, conversations the criminals and the hostile nations and terrorists and what have you are all going to be having a, having a field day. So we need to keep up this, these dynamics. That again needs the, needs the diversity. And we, uh, diversity means having people who can look at those larger areas, make those risk decisions. We can't counter everything, so we have to be selective. We don't have infinite resources, so we have to be selective. Those governance and risk decisions. 
international, there is an international standard in the 27,000 series mm -hmm. for uh, governance of IT security, oh sorry, of, uh, of inf I think it's information security as opposed to cyber security. Information security. Uh, if you look, it has six principles in it. Mm -hmm. And, okay, I'm probably going to get into trouble here. But one of the problems with players like British Standards and the um, International Standards Organization is, in a way, it's not really in their interest to consolidate, is it? Because uh, the, the more standards you have, the more you can sell, <laughs> uh, uh, etc. Et and every, but, every new number for the new little piece of the standard. Yeah. That's the general exactly. rule, that's how, how to implement, that's what actually the control is. <laughs> so it's, there are opportunities to consolidate. One of the areas to consolidate is the six principles of the, um, the 27,004. 14, is it 14 or 41, I think. Check that out, listeners. Uh, whichever it is for, for, for governance in, 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 in for sec. Uh, I think there is for Matches very well, I'm sorry, I'll say this as a, as a student project, matches quite well to the um, standard, which I do remember, because I teach a lot about it, as, uh, the ISO IEC 38500 for IT governance. Oh. Now, of course, it's very important, folks, I was to children that cyber and cyber security is not about IT. But there is a lot of IT that tends to touch on it. But actually, this IT standard, 38500, is the one that I teach because I find it much more flexible. At the very least, the first principle of the specialist cyber governance standard talks um, talks uh, about you know uh, about, about governance, yes. but the IT standard is really bare bones. It basically says responsibility. Understand whose responsibilities are which, mm -hmm. what, and who should be doing what. And I like that candidness. I like that that really firm instruction. But the rest of it more or less matches. Um, you put controls there as well, like in the like, like in normal 27 ISO. Yeah, absolutely. But um, and, and again, this IT standard goes through its very goes through its um, goes through its sections. The final section really touches on, on on everything, and it talks about human behavior. So you design your systems to take human and account for human behavior. But it needs to, and I'm not sure whether any of this understands. So you make that clear. Yes, there are rules. Twenty-seven double O one talks about you know, uh, about building uh, you know uh, um, building systems and more specialist standards within the twenty-seven thousand stuff, which sets out requirements for building systems uh, which are, which um, can be safer and, and more secure. But the key part of this human behaviour side of stuff is not just how a system will be used, but also how a system will be developed. And just think about the pressures to get the latest release of a product out there is on the developers. So what is their incentive to when implement? To 93 controls from Alex A. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So it needs the people to think about those, uh, those issues and also understand the risk Okay, I'm going to use cyber essentials here as, a, as an example. Okay, so the National Cyber Security Centre has, the, has defined the cyber essentials. For those who don't know it, it's essentially a cyber five a day. So just in the same way, so the government says, uh, or the health experts say, you should eat five portions of fruit and veg a day. Basically a baseline. Yeah, it's a baseline. It's not going to make you fit, but it's a good start. Actually, it probably should be, I think, nearer to seven to ten pieces of fruit and veg. But they have to look at people's behaviours, and if you give people too big a target, they won't even start. So it's a baseline, it's a starting point. And from a health point of view, obviously, it has to go together with exercise and not smoking and drinking too much, and all of all of those other all of those other things, plus the things that they that they scare us one day in one paper and then you get another one and another one which says no action. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then you've got the confirmation bias. And I love the ones which say that yeah, you should drink red wine and I don't think the ones which say that you shouldn't drink. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, why do you why do you balance things out? Okay, so coming you know, coming through it there are some basic things which will do some good. And the uh, NCSC or I think it was before that, um, the, uh, its predecessor, 
part of GCHQ. Um, uh, did, their, did their research, as the saying goes, and identify that cyber essentials, not the certificate, because that's not a magic talisman, but actually <laughs> carrying out and having implemented in your systems and your, and your kit, because it's a very technical standard, the cyber essentials will deflect 80% of the low level automated internet facing attacks. So it's a very, very specific thing. The problem being is that people t tend to kind of see that and have higher expectations. And it's really risk agnostic. So we've got the, we've got the uh, hands on technical creation, development, operation, testing, uh, parts of the life cycle. Uh, and I love the standard, uh, standard standards here. ISO IEC 15288, because that really is a soup to nuts, birth to death uh, of systems. Not just the ideas to create them, but also, well, what are we going to do to decommission the system? Well, I've got all of this kit, I've got all of this data. What, what's going to happen to it? Is it going to be, uh, is it going to die of death? Or is it going to be moved into a, into a, into a new processing environment? It's important to kind of think about these things. Um, uh, a little bit like it was said uh, when outsourcing was certainly a very big fashion. Um, one of my colleagues uh, back at uh, an NCC group, um, he always used to say, uh, uh, when it comes to outsourcing, you need to plan the divorce before the marriage. <laughs> That's a slightly depressing way of, uh, of, of, of putting it. But it's all, it's all about thinking ahead, and that's what the governance risk and compliance offers. The cyber essentials side of stuff are basic things to do. The research has shown that do, and it comes also back to this honesty business, this honesty business about uh, telling people, yeah, we're making you aware because we expect you to compensate for the fact that this system is actually insecure and you're now our front line. Yes, I know you're only on a minimum wage and the chief executive <laughs> is, on, uh, is, is on the hundreds of thousands, but we still want you to defend our billions of pounds of information assets. What do you mean it's not fair? Conversations, it might make people a little bit more understanding of how unreasonable some of the, uh, of, of the demands which are made on the people who actually operate the system. But the cyber essentials essentially is risk agnostic. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're creating. If you plug in your system, remember it's the internet facing attacks. So if your system is on the internet and you're not true to those cyber essentials, then you are vulnerable. And that is quite different from saying, okay, well, we've got some personal data here, or we've got some uh, control systems, and actually understanding what the risk is, whether it's something which, uh, yeah, uh, we're, just, uh, we're just kind of running a competition to win some chocolate, or we're managing multi-billion pounds of investments uh, for people's pensions or whatever it, whatever it might be. The cyber essentials is that step is that step away and say, well, let's do it. And it's I would say it's a little bit like a garden, uh, like a garden wall. People can still, of course, people can climb over a garden wall, but most people, most people will walk around it, and therefore you, it reduces the number of threats, the number of threat actors, the number of problems that you have to deal with. And those decisions about health as an immediate slice. And then you, then it's the interaction between the governance, risk, and compliance people who want, if they're genuinely looking to make things safer, then to to be the people and the, and the circuitry, the orchestrators, to work with people who can then design and build build the architecture. Because the first thing with with, with, with governance is to always remember what the objectives are. Now it's interesting, of course. The top objective, actually, for a bank, uh, obviously the students have said, oh, make loads of money. Uh, and I often invite um, colleagues from banking in to come talk. And they will say, yeah, well, obviously you want to make money, but the first objective is compliance. Because <laughs> if they do not comply with the regulators, they can't act. So remembering what the, you know, the core objectives are of any organization, or and even down to an individual level, what your annual objectives are. Which also, of course, comes back to security. 
because um, you have to you know, um, process so many records, make so many whatever it is, etc, etc, etc. When have I got time to think about acting and behaving securely? It's not there. That slows me down. It so, should be natural. So it, it should <laughs> be, but it should be part. It should be part of the process. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I, I, I want to go home. I want, yeah, I want to get. Uh, I've got to you know, go and pick up the kids from school. Want to go out to the pub. So I want to finish at five o'clock. And of course, it's those pressures yeah. that our adversaries will then go and go and play it. So it's, the, it's that understanding. It's that understanding, and also it's having those people. Uh, in the friendly environment to understand the answers, who can actually work to reduce those vulnerabilities and hopefully reduce the burden on the individuals and the organisations. I have to tell you, Danny, you like to talk, and it's, it's such an inspired, such an inspiring story, as you, say, you say. But we need to we need to go we need to go further, and I've got one thing which sits in my head. Uh, I spoke with plenty of candidates, plenty of people about cybersecurity, and when I was asking the question, what makes you go there? I very often heard that sci-fi, sci-fi movie and science fiction brought them into cyber. And I know, and I also saw well, by the, having a, pre a previous conversation with you, that you're a sci-fi sci fan, uh, sci-fi geek. So where do, you, how, where do you see a correlation? Why, why is that? Why sci-fi brings us to cyber? There's probably, there's pro I'm sure there's some, there's probably some, there might be some learned papers on this. Um, and I know it's, it's not universal, it's not universal because, um, maybe, maybe I just ask them about the wrong reading or, or viewing the wrong science fiction things, but I, I always seem <laughs> to, uh, I often say amongst my students and say, right, here we are, University of Manchester, Department of Computer Science, I bet you're all science fiction fans, and everybody kind of looks at their shoes and shakes their head. Um, <laughs> Um, maybe they just don't want to release it. Maybe just want it. It was a bit like being, you know, a Doctor Who fan. Uh, you know, before 2005 when it came back, it was uh, kind of like a secret society <laughs> because uh, you, you, were, you were always made fun of. But uh, now it's cool to like Doctor Who, so that's okay. But I think two things. Firstly, there is uh, it, it, there's the, there's the science aspect, and of course it will bear. I mean, some of it is just like you know, laser guns and let's shoot them off. But even from that point of view, there is technology involved. So it's the imagination of what can be done with technology. Yes. Then the so there's that kind of future view of what can you do with technology, and, and then that exploiting of, of the universe of the of that technology in, the, in different systems. There's also, of course, the science side of stuff. So there we're getting a little bit methodological. I mean, my personal journey, my personal journey, uh, and this, I suppose I then went into computer science, uh, and then in, I was then became a technical writer, um, and then I went into quality management, and then in 1994, as a technical writer in quality management, I was asked to edit what was probably the first information security breaches survey, um, which was being run by a government department, which was then the Department of Trade and Industry, sponsored by the late British Computer Organisation, uh, ICL, uh, and delivered by where I was working at the time, which was the National Computing Centre. So I sort of, that was my journey into information security. All this is interesting. And the next thing, well, eventually it became cyber security. So, so there I am. Behind that, behind that was always, was always my interest in, in science fiction. So yes, the imagination of, of what you can do with technology. But very interestingly, and this went back to a, a school project, uh, where I had to do this uh, critical analysis of, Isaac, of some of Isaac Asimov's stories, was the placement of society and people in the context of this technology and how it affected things. Um, I mean, the immediate thing comes to thought was um, the Foundation series written by Isaac Asimov, and you had uh, um, a galactic empire with loads of resources who built huge power stations and you had the foundation with very limited resources who invented basically belt-sized nuclear reactors which they could carry around with them and do stuff. So, it, you know, so that really fascinated me. The, 
real thing, I suppose, direct, which directed me, went back even earlier, was back in the school library, I found this, uh, it was a falling about, it'd been rebound already, uh, book uh, of a script for a TV series called Quatermass in the Pit. It was actually the third of the stories about, this, about Quatermass, who was a professor. <laughs> uh, Me and Danny can talk forever, but this episode's come to an end. If you want to hear more, tune in for our next episodes. Definitely one of them will be with Danny again. Hope you enjoyed this conversation and wish you a very good day. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to ADHD Founder Talking. ND Axon, we're breaking down barriers to help neurodivergent individuals thrive in the workplace and in life. We offer an inclusive app and support businesses in developing a more inclusive workplace. Visit ndaxon.com to learn more about our mission, podcast, community, and how to get in touch with Michael himself. Together, let's create a world that celebrates neurodiversity and empowers everyone to achieve their dreams.